So a lot of people are still quite mystified as to what exactly Gamergate is. Just give us a brief definition. Well, Gamergate is about a push to use video games to socially engineer people. And it's also about corruption among video game journalists. The word Gamergate is a twist on Watergate. And how this unfolded was gamers began to notice that popular game review websites were promoting these obscure indie games by unknown people that were just basically bad games. And they all seemed to push a political agenda as well. And with a little digging, they found out that the game developers of these games were just rich kids with no talent that had connections with these uh, video game journalists. And obviously, gamers who care about gaming uh, began to complain about this corruption. And suddenly, all of these journalists came out and said, uh, gamers are dead and the industry should no longer produce video games with the consumer in mind. Um, so this and is this about is how pushing the political agenda. Why it's important is because video games are the biggest entertainment industry on the planet. They're bigger than movies, they're bigger than music. An opening day weekend release of a video game can gross two to three times more than its equivalent in the cinema, Avatar vs. Modern Warfare 2 being an example. And Hollywood makes under 30 billion a year profit, whereas video game industry makes over 46 billion dollars a year. This is why it's important, because a lot of people are influenced by the content and the narrative of these video games, which makes it extremely chilling that people would insert their own extremist, radical, political dogma into video games. And that's what's happened um, and what's come to light through this Gamergate scandal. Well, I think the, these individuals who are trying to push this political agenda already control a lot of media. They clearly already control the news. They control movies through Hollywood, um, the music industry as well. Uh, they promote the, the individuals that they want. This is pure nepotism, but also the, um, the cultural Marxist ideology that they want also is, is seen all across sitcoms and movies and films. So the point is, however, that video games is a media that they don't completely control. There is some control over it, but um, clearly by these game developers not being in control of the industry, this is the problem that they are trying to undo um, by causing the game industry to come under their control rather than produce games that gamers would like. And this is one of the criticisms leveled at the pro-Gamergate crowd, the people who expose this scandal by the anti-Gamergaters, is that Gamergate is this astroturf grand conspiracy backed by the patriarchy because we know that a lot of this social engineering, these messages being put into video games, promote third wave feminism and cultural Marxism, as you said. But actually, if you look at it, it's the anti-Gamergate crowd, the people who have been, been exposed, they're the establishment. It comes back to the point again that feminism, third wave feminism, is the establishment. And you look at somebody like Anita Sarkeesian, who has released these, what, five or six videos. It took her three years to release five or six videos after receiving $160,000 in donations. She's made all these videos. She's getting, you know, TED Talks, foundation support. She's on the Time magazine list of 30 most influential people. She gets Marie Claire feature spreads. She gets network news special features about she's being threatened and harassed by all these Gamergate people. So she's the one being backed by the establishment. And yet then they say that Gamergate is part of this grand patriarchal conspiracy. And just get into how the media has reported on this issue complete bias complete ignorance of the facts and the true uh, fundamental issue what's going on here, which is the subversion of the video game industry. The media's made it all about threats and harassment received by Anita Sarkeesian and people like that. Well, absolutely. You know, as soon as the Gamergate scandal began to break out and um, a basically a email ring amongst journalists uh, who were talking amongst each other about how they would need to promote more politically aware games was leaked out. You know, the first thing that happened was 
Um, this fake bomb threat against Anita Sarkeesian was leaked out and apparently all of the Gamergate crowd who are complaining about corruption just happened to be all about harassing her personally. And this is, you know, this is bullshit this... because anyone in the public eye, no matter what political dogma they, they are pushing or they represent, get violent threats. I get violent threats every week, mainly from social justice warriors and liberals because they're the most intolerant, bullying people on the planet, even though they preach tolerance. And, you know, I get the occasional death threat. I've posted them on Twitter many times. And obviously you get the same for your activism in regards to Syria and other issues. But the problem is the media is reporting it as if all the threats and harassment are coming from the Gamergate crowd. Yet it obviously goes both ways. In any of these public issues, threats and harassment goes both ways. And there's an example, which I saw just a couple of days ago. Um, Pillars of Eternity, this video game, I haven't played it, but it's, it's a quite new video game that's been released by this um, company called Obsidian or Obsidian. And in this game, they had a character, um, a, basically a poem, which was making a joke about how he slept with a man by mistake. This offended these um, trans feminists and these other feminists that got offended over this, they complained, demanded that it be changed within the video game. And yet you go to their Twitter account, and I'll show this up on screen, and this trans feminist is sending out tweets saying, quote, kill all men, which is a feminist hashtag that we've seen in the past, or at least put them in concentration camps. So these are the tolerant liberals that oppose Gamergate, these are some of the people complaining about the Gamergate crowd, and yet they espouse the most violent hatred, hateful rhetoric imaginable, and yet the media says that it's all Gamergate people doing that. Well, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, we've both had death threats, but when have the media just, like, plastered the death threats that we've gotten all over the place? Um, never, because we're not one of the chosen nepotism-backed people who are supporting the agenda of the establishment. So, um, you know, as you said, the media is completely biased against uh, the gamers and pushing the idea that gamers are misogynists. You know, um, the thing is, these gamers were normally apolitical people, and what they thought that they were exposing was just bias in game journalism. And what they actually found was the nepotism and the bias was actually much bigger than that and it included the BBC, the ABC, CNN and it shocked a lot of people actually into becoming more active which is a good thing. And the point um, is, so the Gamergate community or the video game community in general is one of the most diverse on the planet. Black people, women, you know, lesbians, gays, whatever. It's one of the most diverse communities on the planet and yet they're all being castigated as misogynists and hateful. They had a hashtag, not your shield. Tell us about that. Yeah, not your shield was basically all of the uh, non cis white males, as they call them, heterosexual male um, gamers. So women, people of different races, um, you know, uh, homosexual men all coming together and saying, we are not your shield to those corrupt journalists that are using sexism and racism to co cover up their corruption. And that, that is these gamers saying, hey, not all gamers are heterosexual male and we are not a misogynist group of people. The argument that the establishment media are, are pushing that gamers are misogynist men who don't want women making or playing games is just basically childish propaganda. And it's totally ridiculous because it ignores the fact that women have been making and playing games for decades without being harassed. In fact, some of the most popular video games ever made were made by women. For example, Portal and Mirror's Edge. If gamers didn't like women developing games, then why would these games be popular? The difference is these games that the women made weren't injected with a third wave feminist cultural Marxist agenda. They were just good games that people enjoyed playing. And that's why the establishment media don't want to report the fact that g women have always been inside the gaming um, industry and inside video game culture. And they also, as part of this subversion, they put out their own video. I mean, you're an avid video gamer. I'm not, but you're well positioned to comment on this. But 
Who was it that released the Depression Quest video game? Tell us about that. I believe that was um, Quinn, Zoe, Zoe Quinn. Quinn. Yes. Um, and it was she... terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard it was terrible and I actually had to play it in order to comment on it. And I can safely say that if you didn't have depression before playing that game, you will have depression by the end of playing that game. <laughs> I don't. I wouldn't even call it necessarily a game. It didn't even have a point, did it? You couldn't even win the game. You couldn't win the game, and in fact, some of the time you couldn't even choose the course of the game. You know, when you play a game, you're supposed to be able to either win or a game. By definition, is at least something where you have to win or lose. So um, the fact that you couldn't win or lose, and not only that, you you basically had were forced to go a certain way. Okay, let me step back a bit. It was text-based. This was completely text, so there's no graphics in it whatsoever. So, have you, if you've ever read a Choose Your Own Adventure book, that's basically what it was, except for the fact that you sometimes weren't able to be given the choice to choose a path. You had to forcibly choose a path. And it's supposed sounds to be... boring as hell. <laughs> It's supposed to sounds somehow like a, explain. Sounds what like an acorn is like. electron game from the 1980s. Well, if it's even worse than that. It's not even a game. Um, game requires you to challenge yourself and to actually have some choice in what happens, and that's not what it. And yet, it received so many awards. And the interesting thing that some of the gamers picked up was the fact that. Um, the people who gave this woman an award for her game, one of them was actually um, having a relationship with her. So this came the idea that, you know, there was some nepotism here. But this, I think it's a slight distraction because it's not just about the fact that this individual had a relationship with the man that gave her a game an award. It was, I believe, because she was pushing an agenda and um, there's a clear... Tell us how that ties into Diagra, because these were the leaked minutes, as far as I understand, that came out, which specified this kind of social en engineering and political correctness that would be pushed through this nepotism. Tell us about the link to Diagra and what Diagra is. Well, Diagra is basically a, um, a forum or what you would call uh, where a lot of people come in to talk about a subject. I forget, I'm just at a loss for the name of the term. But, it's like um, a left-wing foundation, is that correct? Yeah, well, it's not even so much as foundation, more as a, like a digital gaming community. industry sort of con community that come together and they discuss video games. What's more important is that um, the individuals that were in these leaked minutes, uh, they are actually not just part of the media, they're academics as well. And, you know, um, they're also tied to the US government and DARPA and IARPA. And the, these organizations are even more important than DIGRA. DIGRA is just the place where these people come to talk. But, um, you know, the articles that first came out that sort of really, you know, Gamergate was burning, was has been burning for actually quite a few years with these indie games coming out that are getting great reviews that people hated, mostly hated. And so people were already frustrated, but the thing that really pushed it forward was the fact that all of these games media websites suddenly declared that gamers are dead and that the industry should no longer make video games with misogynistic white males in mind. And what these articles were actually um, originated from was a professor, Adrian Shaw, who is a professor at, of communications at Temple University, who first wrote the article that the gaming identity should be destroyed. And she's also featured in these um, diagram minutes that I'm going to go back to in a minute. Um, but she said uh, basically that in, in these diagram minutes, why do we see such tension between academics and game designers? How can we better intervene in industrial logic to disturb that process? How can academics bridge the gap to industry audience to help them do different work? 
How can we disrupt the capitalist norms to facilitate this? Basically, what that's saying is how can we manipulate the game industry to produce games that academics like myself deem worthy? And she's um, not only a professor of communications, she's also um, part of the advocate of homosexuality group, and she's part of a US government IR, IR program called Sirius, which is creepily named after the star of Lucifer. But um, regardless, Sirius, if you go on Sirius's website, which this Adrian show is connected to, um, the About section says, Sirius is a program to use video games to train analysts to recognize their cognitive biases, which basically means to uh, brainwash them or to re-educate them. So this is the sort of thing that Adrian Shaw wants to come about. But is there anything in the leaks that else that you want to point to? Yeah, just the wider point. This is the subversion of an art form. We've seen radical third wave feminists begin to subvert the education system through gender studies. Of course, with their continual phony hysterical outrage campaigns, they try and inject their political dogma into basically everything. We saw that with the comet scientists, that whole ridiculous farce. We've, we've seen them, for example, become outraged about the Athena Tennis Girl poster, which is an iconic piece of art, basically, now from the 70s. So, you know, I've made the comparison. ISIS likes to tear down art in the Middle East. Feminists are now subverting and tearing down art and replacing it with this uh, re-education agenda, which, you know, less than a quarter of American women identify as feminists. It's, it's not a majority movement. It's this minority movement, but it's being supported by the establishment, as you made the point there with the DARPA link, then tell us about this um, email list, which, which was exposed by Breitbart's Milo Yiannopoulos, and how they set the narrative for games in that private email list. Well, um, actually, I believe a man named William Usher leaked out a secret mailing list, as you said, called Game Journal Pro. And it was basically just a email list of games journalists who were promoting this, you know, uh, social Marxist, cultural Marxist agenda, and were trying to shut down any dissidents amongst other journalists. Um, also, amongst them were people in the games industry, game developers, and PR representatives. So um, that was one of the email leaks that showed corruption. There have been other ones that are related to the bigger established media names. Um, one of them was from The Guardian, in fact, where The Guardian editor instructed the journalists not to report about Gamergate um, unless they first talk to one of the journalists and get instructed about what it's about. So um, this, this corruption and nepotism amongst the media is, uh, is quite extensive and thankfully the Gamergate is exposing it. But just for the viewer, bear in mind, everything we're discussing here, everything we're hitting upon, these fine details, none of it has been covered in mainstream media coverage of Gamergate. The whole narrative has been about poor Anita Sarkeesian and poor, you know, feminists getting these harassments and threats. None of this has been addressed. And now the demonization has increased to such crazy intense levels. They made, what was it, a Law and Order episode about a video gamer who turned out to be a murderer. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, you know, it just shows you the level of control they have, that they can even inject these um, propaganda into sitcoms and television shows. As I said, they have control of those already. So the F SVU episode was basically a hit piece and made it seem like the only reason that gamers are upset is because they're, you know, heterosexual white males that are completely misogynistic and just don't want women in gaming. That they are also rapists and, you know, women oh. beating terrorists. In, and it, it's, com it's comical. Even the uh, people who are against Gamergate th thought it was an embarrassing episode. And, you know, it's, I'd like to also touch on the fact that, um, as you said, the bias in the media is just so blatant that when so many people wrote to the Australian ABC against 
their article about Gamergate, the ABC was forced to reply. And what they wrote in their reply was that they chose to cover only the harassment angle and not detail anything about the corruption in the media industry. So they openly so admitted their bias. They openly admitted it. So again, one of the things that characterizes Gamergate is media bias and manipulation. We've even seen Reddit censor people and 4chan censor people for merely discussing Gamergate. Give us another couple of examples of how this has been censored and manipulated by the mainstream media. Well, a lot of people just mentioning Gamergate on Twitter or accounts that are talking about Gamergate are being censored and deleted under the claims of harassment, even though their tweets didn't have any harassment in them at all. This is the level of control that um, is being exerted here. And obviously, there's some powerful people that have a lot to benefit out of it. It's many tentacles, and they plow deep into several different issues. Common Core, Hillary Clinton, and the Bilderberg Group. Tell us how it connects to that. Well, you know, one of the powerful people in the establishment is Hillary Clinton, and she's basically using this big push of third wave feminism to try to promote her presidential campaign in 2016. You know, pretty soon they'll be saying, if you don't vote for Hillary Clinton, then you're a woman-hating misogynist, and just like they're doing with um, gamers. So, uh, basically, this is the kind of way that she wants to become president. Um, just as Obama, you know, was using the whole black man issue to become president. Yeah, um, criticism of Obama was characterized as racist in the early days of his campaign. They played that card over and over again. So Hillary's going to do the same with the sexist card. And then we also have ties to Common Core, which actually Hillary Clinton is also tied to with the foundation of Common Core. Tell us about how it, how it connects to Gamergate. Another man who's tied into it is uh, Bill Gates, and he's putting a lot of money into Common Core. And one of the things he's promoting is the use of video games as an education tool. And uh, it also, Common Core, if you look at the questions coming out, you'll see a lot of cultural Marxist ideals being injected into the education system. And there's no doubt that these video games as an education, re-education tool will also feature them. And there's actually a lot of new startup companies surfacing that are producing video games for education. And obviously these people are tipped off that, um, that these kind of games are going to be marketable. And big name industry like EA are buying these companies and they're getting a lot of money. Um, and what's eventually going to happen is that the American people are going to be taxed um, who subsidize these game companies and the cash is going to be justified as an education expense. Basically, they're going to float these video game companies because they see a crash coming ahead. And, you know, you might say that games like Zoe Quinn's Depression Quest, they are very bad. And even though they're being promoted, you don't have to play them. But if it's injected into the education system, then not only do you have to play them, and be uh, basically tested on them and graded on them, you also have to be forced to buy them. And that's basically um, about the money as well. And, and you know, Bill Gates, as, as, as I mentioned, you know, he was um, a attendee of Bilderberg in 2010, around the same time that he started funding and talking a little about Common Core. And another uh, individual who is related to Gamergate scandal that uh, was actually the CEO of a company called UBM that owns the game journals that attacked gamers and said that gamers should die at the center of the scandal. He attended Bilderberg as well um, twice in 2012 and 2013. So clearly some very high up individuals acting here. So just to encapsulate everything we've talked about, why is this important? Why should people care about Gamergate? Why should people get educated about Gamergate? Well, you know, even for people who aren't interested in gaming, Gamergate is waking up a lot of new young people to the fact that the media is controlled, that the establishment is trying to um, socially engineer their generation, 
and they're very talented people who are very determined to live in a just world and their talents are actually exposing a lot of evidence and links with these individuals that are trying to control and manipulate and basically stay in power through nepotism and it's, it's very exciting it's already caused a lot of industry to lose a lot of money because the weight behind this consumer movement you know they're just basically rejecting the programming they're rejecting um, the force of buying the stuff that is um, inferior and it's, it's very important to be on board with this movement because we don't want the next generation to be so uh, socially engineered and manipulated that they're blind to everything that's happening around them and this is a fight for the future basically so that's why it's important